Now for some more rhetoric. I'm Margaret Mullet, Honorary Professor in the School of History, Classics and Archaeology at Edinburgh. And it's my very great privilege to introduce the next book, which is Florian Leonti's Imperial Visions of Late Byzantium. Uh, but before that, let me remind you of the practical things we've been learning over the last few days. Uh, one, to mute your microphones. Two, to type in the Q&A box, unless you're a panelist, uh, in which case in the chat, and address it to all panelists and attendees. And thirdly, to start writing your questions as soon as they occur to you, so that we're not fighting for time at the end. I first met Florin on paper in 2006 with his brilliant MA dissertation for CEU on the literary network of Dimitris Kidonis, some of which is published in the Annual of Medieval Studies at CEU. I then found him again uh, in Vienna in 2008 for female founders, and then at Dumbarton Oaks in 2009 for a year uh, when he held a junior fellowship. And since then, he's held a straight flush or a full house, maybe, uh, of fellowships at Marie Curie in Athens, uh, Koch at Anamed, New Europe in Bucharest, the International Society for the History of Rhetoric, and Itati. But he's also worked at Tufts on the Perseus project. He's taught uh, at CEU, at Yerevan, at Brno, and two years at Harvard uh, after John Duffy's retirement. And he's now assistant professor in classics at Onomook. He's published uh, more than a dozen substantial articles in prestigious collections and journals. And he's another book apparently coming out this year with CUP, uh, Ephemius Malaki's Oration to Manual First Communance. And he's close to finishing a book on ethos and logos uh, in late Byzantine praise. And so now to the book. It's an important book, I think, for its own merits, but also because it's the first volume in the series Edinburgh Byzantine Studies set up by Niels. May there be many more. This one is a great one to start with. It's imperial. Uh, it's late biz, a local speciality, and it deals with rhetoric, the bedrock of innovative literary texts in Byzantium. I read it three times, once for the press, once to teach network in Thessaloniki, and yes, it has a great network diagram for those who loved Oscars, and then again in the last few days. What is so impressive about it is the way you can see the way that rhetoric operates uh, in late Byzantine politics. Florin takes a few rhetorical texts, the dialogue on marriage, the foundation of imperial education, the seven uh, ethical political orations, and the funeral oration on his brother Theodore, and he sets them in the context of late Byzantine polemic and dialogue. And through rigorous, exhaustive analysis, he allows them to paint the politics, the political thinking, and the part played by rhetoric in both consensus and conflict uh, at the turn of the 15th century. What I found interesting was different each time. This time I found his fascinating, his characterization of the parties of ascent and dissent, his putting together of contemporary analyses of Manuel's literary merits, the detection of the fusion of parenthesis and wisdom tropes in the foundations, the consideration of performance contexts and legible unity of the seven orations, the three interlaced plots of narrative in the funeral oration, and his vision of Manuel as his own maestro ton rhetorum. But I think you want to hear Florin on his book, so please keep your microphones muted and I will mute mine. Florin, the... Uh, <coughs> thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yours. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, uh, can you hear me? Sorry. Yes, uh, very well, Florin. Okay, uh, so I will uh, uh, start my presentation. Thank you very much, Margaret, and thank you, Petros, for this uh, wonderful uh, uh, festival. So, uh, as the title uh, shows, the title of my book shows, this is a study in late Byzantine political views, attitudes, and values, as illustrated primarily in several key texts by the late Byzantine Emperor Manuel II who uh, ruled uh, at the end of the uh, 14th century and the beginning of the 15th century. 
So I have also a small presentation. So I would like to share with you as well. Uh, I hope you can see it. Um, okay. So uh, essentially, I tried to argue that uh, Maniel used rhetoric in negotiating and strengthening his authority in the troubled waters of late Byzantium, where churchmen and court-based groups vied for the attention of wider audiences. I dealt with the construction of discursive strategies that adapted the rules of rhetorical genres to historical circumstances, as Margaret already mentioned. Uh, the author, which I focused on, Manuel II, Paleologos, was both emperor of Byzantium and a prolific author of a very wide range of oratorical and theological texts. His biography, his political biography, suggests that he rose to power from a weak political position in a period of deep social, economic, and political transformations. In a way, his three decade long reign mirrored processes originating in the early Paleologan period, like the efforts to obtain substantial Western aid or to maintain peaceful relations with the neighboring Ottomans. Uh, to an even larger extent, Manuel's career was also influenced by other connected processes like Byzantium territorial fragmentation or dynastic struggles for succession. Unlike in other studies of Manuel's reign, which primarily used sources like official documents, historical narratives, or non-textual materials, I mentioned here the study by George Dennis or by Joe Barker. Uh, so uh, I'm looking forward to Siren's uh, biography of Manuel's as well. Uh, the texts which I explore here fall between uh, oratory and literature. Certain compositions were meant for performance in the court, but more often actually they were only circulated within circles of acquaintances uh, and suffered sub subsequent re-elaboration. So I focused only on four major texts of uh, the emperor manual. So you have a list here, the dialogue with the empress mother on marriage, the foundations of an imperial education, the so-called seven ethical political orations and the funeral oration on his brother, despot of Moria. The reasons I have limited my research to these four texts is, due, is the fact actually that they were written during uh, the first, roughly the first 15 years of his reign. And uh, so roughly between 1394 and 1410. And unlike with other texts of his theological the, the theological texts, for instance, they allow us to better tease out the dynamics and the tensions present in the late Byzantine society. These writings revealed the extent to which the emperor regarded his rhetorical activity as intertwined with, with the administration of, this, of, the, of Byzantium. Uh, moreover, the similarities of content and intention between the four works are indicated by their inclusion in a single manuscript, the Vindoponensis uh, Grecus 98, part actually of a series of four manuscripts dedicated to his son and successor, John VIII Paleologus. Uh, I argue that all these four political uh, compositions were conceived and transmitted as distinct ways of expressing moral and political advice. So we have a deliberative mode present in the dialogue on marriage, a gnomic mode, mode present in the foundation, a mode based on uh, the ancient type of diatribe present in the oration, and a narrative mode in the funeral oration. In the dialogue written during Bayezid's blockade of Constantinople at the end of the 14th century, the usual tone of prose for an ideal political imperial design was replaced with a deliberative stance, as Manuel portrays his mother as a prom promoter of realpolitik in the very difficult circumstances of the besieged Constantinople. Later, in the foundations and the orations, uh, Manuel combined the categories of father and teacher into one authorial voice, and he played with his needs of addressing 
uh, his needs as a father addressing his son and trying to teach his son on the one hand and the service to the prince elect uh, also his son john the eighth uh, so the uh, the last text i analyzed uh, the funeral oration uh, in the in this text manuel emulated the traditions of both uh, panegyrics and epics or chronicle, so narrative, narrative genres, and conceived a fully fledged historical account of Peloponnesian history during his brother's Theodore Despotate. So these four texts highlight Manuel's particular representation of imperial authority. In terms of imperial ideology, uh, the novelty, I think, consists of the fact that he reworked the ancient representation of a philosopher king in the form of a rhetorician king and put forward a personal version of the system of kingly virtues. Uh, usually the system was uh, co consisted of the four cardinal virtues uh, and he replaced them actually with humility uh, and put actually humility, Tapino of Rossini on top. He often pictured himself in the guise of a didaskalos not only of his son to whom he addressed his texts, but also of his subject. Uh, his, so these four texts, uh, I argue, configured a discourse that was distinct from other competing contemporary discourses displayed by the main groups that I was able to identify for this period. That is the ecclesiastics and the court rhetoricians. Uh, concerning uh, the ecclesiastics discourse, the extant texts indicate that the members of the high-ranking hierarchy, like Simeon of Thessaloniki, Macarius of Ankara, or Joseph Rienios, uh, and several others as well, uh, held quite radical ideas about the emperor's authority, whom they, they regarded as holding a lower position in relation to the patriarchs uh, and subsequently wrote several uh, treatises, essays, and so on. Uh, <laughs> however, unlike the ecclesiastics, the imperial rhetoricians continued to support the idea of the omnipotence of imperial power in Byzantium. So even George Gemistos Platon, the famous uh, uh, Neoplatonic philosopher, from Mistras, who preached extreme political reforms that entailed a return to the values of ancient Sparta, agreed up upon the appropriateness of monarchical rule. So even if he uh, devised a system, of, let's say, uh, uh, that was more socially balanced, he still thought that a monarch was the best uh, way for uh, decision-making processes. In their encomia um, addressed to the emperor, the rhetoricians praised extensively the emperor's deeds, his dynastic lineage, and his direct successor, John VIII, like any encomia uh, would do. Uh, among the usual virtues identifiable in, uh, in such encomia, however, the, these uh, authors like uh, Manuel Himsel uh, uh let's say, if we look at the uh, at this uh, uh, diagram, so we see a few of them: Plethon, even uh, Kidonis, as well, <laughs> Demetrius Chrysoloras. Uh, they all praised and described the emperor as a skilled rhetorician and teacher, not only for his son but again for the entire uh, polity. Moreover, unlike the ecclesiastics who preached a kind of orthodox utopia, they emphasized the Romanness of the Byzantine identity. Yet, by contrast to the, uh, to the orator's project, uh, which was often shaped by personal um, attitudes and standards, uh, <clears throat> and standard values uh, arising from the uh, epideictic rhetoric, Manuel's vision of imperial authority linked more tightly rhetoric to the idea of best governments. 
clearly each program uh, undertook to fulfill a special need. Uh, whereas the uh, orator's program conceived rhetoric as key to social survival and uh, as a reiteration of past ideological tenets, Manuel's pro political program displayed in his four texts transformed it into a guide to the salvation of the Byzantine state. Thus, his rhetoric deliberately omitted praise and engaged intensely with the political present, since, as he often argued, the mission of rhetoric was to articulate visions widely acceptable for most citizens. So, uh, and I will finish uh, now uh, regarding his style of government, the use of multiple authorial voices, reflecting several rhetorical approaches, uh, as I mentioned, deliberative, narrative, economic sententious or didactic, combined with his priestly stance, which is present, especially in his homilies, uh, Manuel also authored several homilies, suggests that the emperor sought to appeal uh, to distinct kinds of audiences by heavily relying on his elaborated rhetorical texts, Manuel put forward the notion of an authority which would preserve most the imperial prerogatives, despite these vigorous claims coming from other groups. This rhetoricized version of the empire helped him mediate between court parties who found themselves in prolonged and bitter conflicts, such as the one between the Orthodox hierarchy and uh, the late Byzantine uh, converts to Catholicism. Ultimately, with these four political texts, I think he promoted a sustainable level of political concord. And as he was aware that he could not maintain unanimity, he proved actually to hold a quite realistic approach to the political challenges of uh, late 14th and early 15th century. So thank you very much. Uh, so if you have questions, 